Um, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, kind introdu introduction. Um, I'm uh, from Seoul, South Korea, and I was born in uh, late 1950s. So then I grew up in uh, Seoul when it was 1960s and 70s when the country was actually quite poor. I remember that when I went to school, in elementary school the very first year, uh, the class uh, had over 100 kids uh, with no desks. So you have one teacher, uh, 100 kids sitting on a floor and learning how to read and write. And uh, even up to a high school, uh, by that time at least we had desks, but uh, high school class was over 80 kids per one teacher. So um, when uh, my daughter now goes to public school and many of the teachers complain to me that, oh, my class is over 25, I can't teach them because <laughs> there are too many kids. I have a little, uh, little sympathy uh, to such comments. Um, I think that uh, poverty also had great impact on how uh, it exacerbated uh, the difference between how parents treated girls and the boys. When I was growing up in the uh, 1960s, my parents had five kids, two boys and three girls. And uh, when we were to have dinner, um, my father will have dinner first with uh, my brothers. And what was left over, uh, my mother and we were going. And, and so at the time, because it was how it was, it didn't seem there's nothing wrong with it. But now I look back on it, 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 it was very unfair. But what's really interesting about living in a homogeneous population is that uh, they impose on specific rules on you. And you don't know any different. And therefore, I don't remember living in Korea if I felt uh, sad or bad about neither the poverty or the discrimination. Only when I immigrated to this country when I was 22, <clears throat> and I, I, to Dayton, Ohio, of all places, that's where my family immigrated to. And uh, I went to college, uh, and I, I noticed that uh, there was much less discrepancy between boys and girls. And I remember uh, saying to myself, I'm in America, you know, I made it. <laughs> this is really great. Um, uh, only to find that one day I was uh, walking on a street um, on my own and uh, there was some shouting and when I looked uh, there were a bunch of guys on a convertible uh, shouting at me saying things like jabs and chinks and putting their eyes open and, and uh, that's when I have to confess when it happened the very first time. Uh, I, it, Coming from homogeneous, of course, Korean society, I, I never was discriminated in that way. So this was a rude awakening to me. And, uh, and morale for such experiences to me is that for whatever environment you might be in, you just have to do your best. And uh, adversaries like uh, when I was in Korea, and I used to be always very good student, but the aspiration that my mother provided to me to be a good student was so then I can go to good college and then hopefully I will be now having an arranged marriage with perhaps a physician. And if I were to be really lucky, maybe I'll meet a professor. So <laughs> uh, with such environment, when I went to college in Korea, I was um, choosing a a department where I could go and study something just fundamental because it never occurred to me to get a job afterwards because my job was supposed to meet a best husband. So um, I was thinking either to study philosophy or physics. And so I went to my parents and I asked them which one should I choose? And <laughs> they were extremely surprised because they were hoping for me to study something like home economics or something like that, or maybe French literature. Uh, so uh, for Gopi, they didn't want to have a woman scientist in the house because there's definitely not going to have arranged marriage one there. So then they came and told me to study f uh, philosophy. So then I went and applied to physics department. <laughs> so, uh, uh, luckily, I got in. And indeed, 
just very similar to your experience. When I went to physics department, um, of course, I was the only girl student. All the professors and students and graduate students were male. And in my case, I, I took that uh, situation as the best opportunity as I could because um, my name, Mi Young, uh, in Korean is like Mary. No one can dispute that this is a girl's name. So when uh, the acceptance of the new class came, the, the department they had all the you know, students' name. And when they realized that there was a name Mi Young, they knew that they now had a girl student. So <laughs> whole department got wild. They <laughs> welcomed me with open arms. And uh, I think that all throughout the college years when I was in Korea, I never bought my own lunch, nor carried my backpack. So, <laughs> so uh, that went very well. But while I was taking physics uh, courses, um, the mandatorily, I had to also take other science courses. And that's when I uh, found biology as my call. And when my family immigrated to the US, then I switched my uh, major in molecular biology. And I, I minored physics because I, I studied enough of, of physics. Well, fast forward about now 31 years later, uh, here I am standing in front of you uh, as a vice president of science programs at the Kevley Foundation. Since then, uh, I have become a mother, but I am a kind of mother who can uh, do calculus homework with my daughter. At the same time, we can go uh, shopping and then buy wonderful dresses together. Um, I have met a husband who is indeed, it turned out, physician and who is a professor at the same time. So not because I was arranged to him, but because it so happened I fell in love with a person who has such a vocation. So in many different ways, America, I think, has served me well. And uh, having said that again, there's always on one hand and on the other hand. Now I am a, a woman who is extremely busy. <laughs> I have to run my household, I have to raise our kids, I have to help my husband, and uh, at the same time, I have to work really hard. So I think that uh, combining all these things now have become my challenge, as many of you who are sitting here have. So uh, that leads me to now going into the title that you gave me, the word according to Kavli, and maybe uh, I can use this one, right? Okay, here. So the Kelly Foundation is established uh, in December 2000. So as of this month, we're 12 years old. We're a quite young foundation. And the founder is shown in here, uh, uh, who is uh, Fred Kavli. He's a Norwegian-born physicist who immigrated to this country about mid-1950s. And uh, in a couple of years, uh, he already founded his own company called Kavli Co. Uh, it became one of the uh, world's largest suppliers of sensors of aeronautics industry in 1960s and you know, 70s, and then in automobile and computer industries in 80s, 90s, and, and so on. Fred actually has many, many honorary uh, doctor degrees by now uh, from all over the world, not only from the States, but also from Europe and Asia alike, and he has uh, been awarded with a variety of different uh, awards, including the uh, Carnegie um, Awards for Philanthropy. But I thought that I will mention a little bit about Fred Kavli I know. Uh, anyone who meet him once, they can tell that he's a very down-to-earth uh, person, and he's a very modest man. Uh, I often see him at the grocery store over the weekend. Uh, he. Um, the other day, he told me that he had a very, very nice jacket on. So I said, ah, Fred, this is, you look handsome, great. And then he said, I bought this at the Marshalls. <laughs> and then he said that it was on sale for 169, but I waited two more weeks, and then I bought it with 119. So <laughs> he's, he's very uh, conscientious when it comes to buying his own clothes, but he's extremely generous to scientists like ourselves. He has already committed uh, his entire wealth to the Kavli Foundation. So we're extremely, I think, uh, lucky to have someone like Fred Kavli working on behalf of scientists. Simply put, the mission of the foundations are two. Uh, one is to advance science, and the other 
is to make sure that we promote public understanding of both science and the scientists who perform science. And uh, we focused on four fields, actually very similar to Gruber Foundation, uh, astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and in our case, fourth field, which is theoretical physics. I have uh, many, many different programs for the foundation, uh, but given the time limitations today, I wanted to actually showcase two specific programs. Uh, one of which uh, represents how we support uh, science to advance its discoveries. Um, in particular, uh, the Cavalry Institute program. And the other is for us to promote public understanding of science and scientists. And among the programs we have for that endeavor is the Cavalry Prizes. There are uh, 16 Kavli institutes around the world. Uh, two of them are theoretical physics institutes. Six belong to astrophysics institutes. Four nanoscience and four neuroscience. Fred Kavli believes uh, there's no border within science. And so our institutes are spread out around the world. Six astrophysics institutes reside uh, in uh, Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge in UK, uh, Peking University in China, University of Tokyo in Japan, Stanford, University of Chicago, and MIT in the States. Four nanoscience institutes are in Harvard, Cornell, Caltech, and TU Delft in Netherlands. And four neuroscience institutes are in Trondheim in Norway, San Diego, you see San Diego, Columbia, and Yale University. And two theoretical physics institutes, and our, the very first actually Cavalier Institute, which was from UC Santa Barbara, and second theoretical physics institute is in, also in Beijing in Chinese Academy of Sciences. The Kavli Foundation has clear intention to expand the number of Kavli Institutes up to 20 in foreseeable time. So one of uh, the biggest jobs I have is to look for those new Kavli, uh, four more Kavli Institutes. These um, what I just mentioned, you can find it in our website and, and, and other resources. Uh, and I also brought some brochures uh, that's sitting out on the table. So if you're interested in, uh, you can learn more about them. What you don't find in brochures and so on are the details of how actually our institutes are established as well as how it runs. Uh, and this again has a lot to do with Fred Kavli's philosophy. When he began uh, foundation, he actually had only one intention, and that is to support excellence in science. And he didn't know what would be the venue that he can improve the excellence in science. He believed that excellent scientists will discover. And so he asked many scientists uh, who were very good. And he quickly learned that many good scientists already are very well funded. So he wondered how he could actually possibly help them. And he learned from the very first scientist he spoke with that every scientist seemed to have uh, two elements that's really lacking nowadays when it comes to funding opportunity. First is independence of decision making. Nowadays, so many funding agencies, even private funding agencies, tend to come to scientists and tell them what they should study, uh, how they should study, or how they should have a reporting structure of a lot of paper trail. And he heard that time and again. Another um, comment that he heard time and again was that the funding is always finite time, let's say three years or five years. And even some centers that's given for 10 years uh, has to have five-year review and then uh, end for sure by 10th year. 
So scientists asked, but science takes a long time to, uh, to really make a clear discovery that will transform the field. Uh, it will be great. It, it doesn't matter if it's a larger amount of money, but rather if we know the consistent amount of money will come, so then we can really try the kinds of experiments that, that sounds crazy but could really give rise to very important discovery, that will be a much better opportunity. So all of the Kavli Institutes we have uh, are um, funded by endowment. So these institutes last forever within those universities. And that uh, institutes now then receive payout of those endowments that they can, uh, they can expect every single year, it never ends. And another element is that uh, Kavli Foundation's funds are being utilized by our scientists and their decision making only. The Kavli Foundation does not have a single saying in what and how it's completely unrestricted funds. They can uh, use it for small seed funding if it's needed or for best dinner they can imagine. To us, those both are very important because sometimes by having, I think that someone mentioned about lunch hours uh, at Brandeis, you know, those, no one likes to fund uh, having nice lunch at great restaurant. Our funds, if they think that that's what's gonna make difference, it's up to them to decide. So uh, we think that we have a very different way of, of funding uh, science and we hope that in doing so that we can make difference I think that another more important thing that we're trying to do is that because we're the foundation who's supporting scientific endeavor, but in a very neutral way, because we don't make grants in specific scientific endeavor, and therefore uh, we're, we as a funding agency become very neutral party in specific scientific endeavor. And although uh, we're a small foundation. Of course, Fred Kavli has a great ambition to really make difference in science. So we look for true collaborations. In this case, of course, scientists should collaborate. But in our minds, funding agencies should collaborate. And I think every funding agency, whatever they do, can complement our activities in support of scientists and then advancement of science. So here is a great um, example that I always talk when I give a t um, speeches. And that is going from great ideas to the Eureka moment takes, of course, tenacious effort by all the scientists. But it also takes a lot of resources. And the largest resources at all times come from federal funding agencies, NIH and NSF and others alike. Um, so what can foundations do? especially when it comes to supporting basic science, the funding capacity among the private foundations are very limited. Um, so in our minds, we don't want to, of course, give up. So we will try our best to utilize what's really an advantage to be a foundation. And that is, we can be agile in making decisions. We can be flexible. We can be nimble. And so then we can participate a lot in generating ideas, following up on ideas in every step of this process. And we can be finding the niche spaces and then making this possible. Because federal funding agencies, as large funds as they have, of course, they have a lot of limitations. And we can find those niches and make difference. In addition, we think that foundations can play a great role in between the scientists and the federal funding agencies and make this process go faster and make it much more efficient. And so, not to mention, of course, we should always include I industry. So I wanted to give a, one example of how we practice this um, sort of kind of pr a procedure that we have in mind. I think that no one disputes that nowadays people truly believe, and I think the BioX uh, example that Carla showed is, is a great one, and that is merging physical science and life science will really lead to great next discoveries. But 
merging those two is actually really hard in practice. Uh, and there aren't that many scientists like uh, Joe and myself who have actually experienced it. Uh, and so um, I have been to many, many different kinds of conferences and think tank uh, places where how to do this right. And uh, it occurred to me at a certain point, well, the Cavalry Foundation supports quite disparate fields, but one belonged to life sciences, which is neuroscience, and one belonged to physical science, which is uh, nanoscience. Why don't we just have them meet together and discuss and see if they find any convergence within them? So um, in collaboration with Gatsby Charitable Foundation in London and Allen Institute in Seattle and my Cavalry Foundation, three of us put together a workshop and put together not those people who have been actually working together before, but people who are excellent in their own field, neuroscientists who never really work with nanoscientists or nanoscientists who never imagined that they will work on any biological studies. And I put, we just put them together. We have actually a beautiful venue uh, of London called Cavalry World Society International Center. It's an 80 acre uh, beautiful country home uh, in Buckinghamshire, having about 50 bedrooms, uh, beautiful conference facility, and, and it's just wonderful. So we brought them together. And then out of that workshop, which was in September 2011, the idea of neuroscience where as advanced as their thoughts are today. Um, the holy grail idea is that they don't still have a single unifying theory as how whole brain works. Uh, and one of the reasons that they identified was because they don't know how brain activities are like as a whole. They know how to measure a lot of uh, neuronal activities in single cell level. And we see lots of data set from fMRI and you know, those MRI, uh, MEG, and other uh, images showing patches of brain that lights up. But those, each patch can be as many as 30,000, if not a million neurons. So we don't know how things work in between. And hence, we don't know how brain functions. So uh, out of uh, then meeting, a lot of neuroscientists thought that if there would be systematic tool developments to go and measure in between those layers of uh, neuronal circuitry level. I think Kala yesterday showed a beautiful diagram showing from the cells to the brain and then in between. She had almost like computer chip-like circuits. And such activity will take um, not just from NIH, but other funding agency has to work together. This is an endeavor of decade, endeavor of century. And so we were able to push through our idea generation, quickly putting together lots of other workshops already, right away. So we've been uh, putting together a lot of workshops and gathering other foundations, going together to go to OSTP and look for their leadership as well as going to NIH, NSF, and uh, DOE and DOD. So for the moment, there is a concerted effort um, that's led by OSTP now um, as they're one of the grand challenges of 21st century. This project now is called Brain Activity Map uh, Project. So I came up with the name Brain Activity Map. and uh, in each, uh, The acronym is BAM, B-A-M, BAM Project. Uh, it appears to be, is going to be chosen as a grand challenges and it's gonna be announced around March by president. So this is a great example how collaboration and communication among the funding agencies, each one of us, even NIH by themselves, could not have made this initiative. But together, we can make, I think, huge difference in, in science. And these are some of the practical activities the Cavalry Foundation is, um, is putting our effort in, in making difference in science. So, so that's our scientific endeavor. Uh, we have a variety of different programs that relate to making sure the public understands science and as well as uh, what scientists do. And one of the, our um, post-child uh, program for that is uh, the Cavalry Prizes. I think that uh, the guideline uh, that we have is, I think, quite similar to Gruber, Gruber Foundation and Gruber Award. 
But in our case, um, it's a joint venture between uh, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, uh, Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, and the Kavli Foundation. And the way we actually select uh, winners, uh, our composed selection committee is composed by uh, different national academies around the world. So American National Academy, but as well as Norwegian Academy, Royal Society, uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, French Academy, and Chinese Academy. All the members come together and form a committee, and then they then decide who should be the winner. Um, and uh, these are awards for three different fields, astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. And um, prize uh, winners uh, receive um, million dollars, a scroll, and a gold medal. Uh, for each of the three Cavalier Prizes. Uh, and nomination process, again, is very similar to Global Foundation. It's open to all, except we, too, don't actually accept self-nominations. Self the intent and scope of the prizes is to recognize outstanding scientific research honor highly creative scientists, and promote public understanding of scientists and their work. And we hope that Kavli Prize program will foster international cooperation among scientists. I want to just mention, because I'm here at Rosalind Franklin Society talk, that um, I just compare and contrast between our Cavalry Laureate in 2010 and 2012. What we've had gone through only three cycles of Cavalry Prizes, I think, that were far behind from uh, Global Foundation in that way. Uh, so 2010 winners don't differ very much from 2008, in a sense. Good news from this picture is that Cavalry Laureates get to be invited by Oval Office, so that's fabulous. Uh, and so he did not win Cavalry Prize, but he hosted our winners. Uh, that's a good news. But the bad news is, as you can tell, that there is no gender balance there. For both 2008 and 2010, all the winners were uh, men. And this is where things get very, in my mind, very sensitive. So when we had 2010 winners were selected, and because in our case, the Kavli Foundation actually does not get involved in any process with selecting Kavli Prize winners. And we shouldn't, because we have all these Kavli Institutes. Possibly some of the winners will come out of those institute professors. And so we should not be involved in these uh, decision, not only selection decision making, but also even setting up what philosophies should be the Kavli Prize and, and so on. So we have been extremely hands off in this. And Fred Kavli in general, he's, a, he's an amazing person. I mean, he really likes to listen to the professional's opinions. And he, you know, th going back to this independence of science, scientists and their activities and thinking, I mean, he's very much into that. And therefore, since our committee members are all scientists, he never really put any word in how Kavli Prize should be processed or who should be the winners and so on, except after 2010 announcement. Uh, we have actually a uh, meeting with Norwegian colleagues, uh, just going over how the prize you know, process went and how should we uh, program our cele celebration um, event. Uh, the celebration event is actually really exciting, and I would love to actually invite many of you from this room next time. Uh, it's given by Norwegian King, and uh, and it's a wonderful event. Um, but for the first time, Fred Kavli actually uh, came, and then he really asked actually one question, and that was mentioned by Marianne yesterday. He asked a simple question. Do you think there is no women scientist deserving to receive Kavli Prizes? And he said, I would really like you going and asking selection committee this simple question, and, he, and please ask them that I personally asked. And if you come back and tell me that there's no candidate who's deserving to win this prize, I'll take that, because I want professionals to make this decision. But if you don't think so, 
why can't we not have women winners? And surely enough, in 2012, these are our winners. <laughs> So uh, we have uh, three winners in astrophysics, and we have Jane Lu here today, who will give a talk. We have single winner for nanoscience. We're just so thrilled, Millie Dresselhaus. And then we have three winners in neuroscience. And so these are uh, Cavalry Prize winners of 2012, and we hope that this uh, tradition will continue. Thank you. I just want to thank Rihanna for coming and, and talking with us because we have been looking at this from not so afar and obviously looked at the trajectory and obviously with this wonderful group of women in the award winners this year, we're thrilled, have absolutely been thrilled that we have two of them here today. The other two were also invited at conflicts. They will be invited next year and I assure you we will get them to come. But it is so important to hear this evolution and this personal side, both of your story, of Mr. Cobley's story, and the foundation's story. And I, I just think we should be thrilled with progress and the future. Um, so if you want to take some questions for, for you know. <laughs> It's a wonderful story, and I, um, it's also, especially following Patricia's presentation, looking at statistics, I was wondering with the new initiative in terms of workshops and in bringing together neuroscientists and nanoscientists, what are the proportions of women you have participating there? So uh, <clears throat> the answer to you is a shame on me because <laughs> there aren't that many women scientists who do come to those uh, workshops as many as we hope they would. I want to actually bring up that specific content in this table because when I look at organizers of those workshops, often they are men. And um, I want to bring up two different issues here. First and foremost, actually they do want to, uh, okay, they don't really think about men-women issue and they just naturally uh, attract to those colleagues whom they are close to. Very often, there are other men. But the other thing is that even if they want to, very often, it turns out that many great women scientists are being sought after in these kinds of activities more so mm -hmm. nowadays. And so they, their calendar is busier. It's an interesting combination. So um, uh, that's, I think, that had also uh, inflicted on when we were trying to find the committee members, for selection committee members for Cavalry Prizes. When we were seeking women scientists to be part of selection committee, that was a very difficult task. And so it's something to think about. Uh, I mean, for example, I'm being asked to be a board member of a thousand different places. And you know, I'm a door, and like I think Google Foundation, we too are a very small foundation, hoping to do a lot, and therefore uh, my activities are very inestraneous. And on top of it, I can't be the board members or advisory members of every organization. So there's a bit of, I mean, in certain ways, you had that traffic jam <laughs> between the transcription and then and I think our application. Uh, there's some of that effect nowadays. You, you might want to look in different places than you typically do. I think, again, we have a situation where we have a lot of young women and few, and then fewer in the mid, sort of the, the, now the top of the class, but there are some older ones who really are not being tapped, who should be looked at, uh, and I think could bring a maturity as well as you know, the enthusiasm. Absolutely, and in effect that's what it usually ends up to be. The problem there is that when uh, the discussions are more driving uh, with exactly what they do for a living today, then those younger women scientists can contribute as much as any other colleagues. But very often Cavalry Future Symposiums, like the programs I have, tend to be things that are visionary. 
things that only comes from people who had a lot of experiences in the past, not only in science, but also in other administrative roles. And therefore, when they come, they hardly can speak because not because they don't want to say anything. It's just because they don't know what to say. So it, we really need time to mature in that perspective. Yes. You, you are still giving those women that don't speak an experience that helps mm -hmm. them to grow, and you have to keep that in mind. Um, I work at the National Science Foundation, so the first-time panelist is not always the same as someone who has experience serving on review panels. There's a big, big change in almost everyone between the first time they're on a panel and the second time. And also we're involved with organizing um, many workshops and conferences and things like this. And sometimes you have to just say, okay, yes, we already thought of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Can you name another woman? And sometimes if you go back to them and you say, please, you know, just think about it. And uh, people will find um, others that they hadn't initially thought of. They have sometimes just have to be pushed a little bit. I realize, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Takes more effort. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, okay. <laughs> so I'm impressed by the many institutes you have. One thing I did notice is that uh, these institutes are distributed, uh, two in Beijing and uh, in the United States, they're on East Coast and West Coast. So have you, do you have future plans <laughs> <laughs> of expanding into some of the other? Uh, so uh, some of the criteria that we are indeed yeah. looking at uh, is uh, geography. Uh, not only geography within the U.S., but also around the world. Uh, I am uh, exploring countries in uh, Australia and other countries in that hemisphere, as well as a lot of other different uh, European countries. In addition, within U.S., you know, like uh, Midwest, like Northwestern, Michigan, Illinois, Austin, and, and so on. And, and so we are uh, paying attention to. Having said that though, I think that um, unlike federal funding agencies, I think that the ad advantage of private foundation is that because we don't have to report to anyone, we should still make one priority, and that is we must compare back to back which university pro uh, provided the best numbers of scientists who can lead Cavalry Institute for the next hundred years to come. Now, uh, idea here is that we're setting up 20 for the moment, but in the future, uh, of course, foundation has funds for the you know, later years that we could indeed establish many more. Uh, but again, this is sort of it's the, our boardroom kind of discussion where if you want to really keep um, the excellence, you want to make sure that you don't have too many. So it, it's a balance that we will have to make. But I have visited a variety of those universities in the middle, including Wisconsin, I'm sure you're getting from that. <laughs> so, and, and Rice University and others in Texas. So we are making an effort to, to do it. You know, one thing, and before your question, sure. apologies. I, I do want to bring up in this room again, in this such conversation will never happen in anywhere else. And that is, <clears throat> you have to wonder, like, you know, we have an amazing board members. I mean, as I mentioned to you, Fred Cowley to me is one of the just gentlest, nicest, smartest, I mean, just the best person I could imagine. And as a scientist, I mean, really, you know, godsend person. Having said that though, he's very comfortable with other guys. In our boardroom, everybody is just like him, white male, very overly, you know, ex-presidents of our universities uh, and so on. And um, we had tenure review for the foundation and uh, we had uh, great reviewers. And uh, the reviewer came in and said, okay, I'm sitting in this boardroom, only woman I see is Mi Young, and she's not the board member. <laughs> so it, it, there's, uh, you know, even with great intention, someone like Fred Cowley, who has hired me and who treats me with the most, I think, uh, respect and and uh, and everything, 
and still our boardroom is limited. So I think this is an issue that I don't want to just push it off because this is how it is. I, I just wanted to go back to Dominic's data from yesterday because I thought it was interesting to see how many people were getting their science information online. And the U.S. Science Journalism Awards and a science workshop, I wondered how many of the people involved or being recognized in those programs are bloggers or write for online publications and whether you've seen any shift in that. Um, so uh, among the... Um, journalism programs, we have uh, two in particular. Uh, I'll mention one because I really think that that's a very amazing program. AAAS has a science journalism award for the past 46 years or something of that nature. And they have, on one hand, what I'm understanding is that that's one of the most prestigious science writers awards. Um, but they had great difficulty maintaining their program because Many people don't like to provide funds for winners for science journalists. They are interested in more for scientists themselves. Um, but many pharmaceutical companies, for example, are very interested in supporting such programs or other industries for that matter. So AAAS had to resort themselves with like J&J &J and other groups actually supporting their program. Soon as that happened, uh, the good sort of news media, for example, New York Times and Wall Street and NOVA programs stopped nominating their own people for that award because they didn't want to mingle getting an award paid by Johnson & Johnson. So we stepped up and we provided actually endowment for that program. It meant that uh, science journalists' award in AAAS will last as long as AAAS <laughs> lasts. We hope many more hundred years to come. So. Um, Within that program, uh, I think uh, they have uh, seven different uh, categories. Uh, of those, three are relating to web uh, version, uh, including its blogging and, and others. So I think that things are changing. So among the also programs, uh, we have collaboration with Society for Neuroscience called BrainFacts.org, 100% internet driven. There's no paper trail on that project at all. Lots of blogging. Uh, on this side. So I uh, heard a lot about foundations yesterday and today and was celebrating the introduction of women to the Cavalry Gloria, which is <coughs> But I haven't heard any foundations that are saying we have to go out and look not just for women, but all kinds of people living in the United States. And I last week was at a meeting in Boston teaching mainly um, disparities students and these students are now coming into their own mm -hmm. and we need foundations to encourage them and move them up to the level, men and women, uh, who uh, do the kind of work that we receive these awards. Sure, I think Susan, I mean this is a very important uh, element I think people are aware and a lot of activities are needed to happen but one of the things that in our boardroom that we discuss very often is it's about to make difference for smaller foundations they have to focus. I mean we're so uh, disciplined in our boardroom that Fred Kavli himself cannot come up with his own idea. <laughs> Everyone in the room has to stick with our strategic planning for this decade and we must uh, be disciplined and going after each step that makes sense for our mission. So it's not because we don't think that, uh, let's say, bringing minority and diversity in science is not important. It's not because, it's because we can't tap ourselves in all. We think that um, maybe another 10, 20 years down the road, foundation will have much larger funds. Uh, and by that time, all our institutes will be much more established as well. Then perhaps we will expand our capacity. But this is a foundation that's like an putting a nail just all the way to the ground. I mean, our boardroom is really disciplined. They don't look around, they don't do anything like that. They uh, go with those two in the way they decided in their first decade of Foundations Foundation. So, but I hear you. You know, another thing is STEM education and, and all others. There are large issues that needs to be 
taken care in scientific uh, community. There are a lot of private foundations and corporate foundations who are now focusing on K through 12 education for girls and underrepresented minorities. And even as we talked about how to focus the Rosalind Franklin Society, we talked about the need to focus, as you said, our niche was focusing on postdocs and high achieving eminent women who still are not getting the visibility and interaction that we hope. So that was the niche that we chose primarily to focus on. And in that process, we've looked a lot at what's going on in the pipeline. And there are many things going on. I'd be happy to, to talk with you about what some of those are. The Exxon Foundation, Exxon Mobil is one. Uh, Chevron is one. Um, so a lot of the companies that need the pipeline of young people in science focus on women and, and um, underrepresented minorities. The other is, if you look at the Intel Science Awards now, all those have now begun to focus on and support young girls and minorities in, in science. And only recently, in the past three years, have we seen the top winners be women and minorities. So I think there is a lot going on in that area. And I, I absolutely support what Young was saying. We all have to make these niche choices. But I think that's an area that's not ignored at the moment. Um, and I'd be happy to share some of what we know about that and obviously hear what what you're seeing from where you are, too, would be helpful. I think women have to be taught or encouraged to participate in board membership and to step up and show that A, that they're interested, and B, that they are willing to be nominated. Different people have said to me over this meeting, oh, it's so much work for somebody to nominate you. You know, I hate to ask or there's so, there's so much paperwork, and they don't step up. They don't feel, perhaps, that they should step up and have somebody put them on a board, or certainly on a corporate board. And yet, and so perhaps there needs to be a way to educate women, and maybe we'll take it on from the foundation, to show women ways in which they can participate, both in foundations and in corporate boards, and how to think about it, and how to do it in an appropriate and an effective fashion. What do you think? Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, re related to that, um, <clears throat> there are, have been a proliferation of prizes uh, in science mm -hmm. in the last decade. And we actually have, had, and there are some institutions uh, who are represented up on the board there, uh, who are very, very good at nominating people yes. for prizes. And so we looked into this, and the ones that do it best are people who hire somebody full-time just to nominate people for prizes. Oh my goodness. It's very expensive. Wow. And, well, you think about it, that you add up all of the prizes, I mean, the society prizes and the um, National Academy prizes and the, this prize and that prize and all the ones we've heard here about, it's an enormous number. Actually, a huge number, hundreds and hundreds of them. And so uh, I know, because I nominate people for a lot of prizes, um, it takes an enormous amount of work. And then if you have to do that work, uh, it's, you know, you have to get, sometimes you have to get letters from colleagues to support this. And I used to be on the Alaska Foundation jury. I was there for 15 years. I saw what good nominations were all about. And it is a huge amount of work. And so we are actually considering hiring someone not full time, but you know, maybe a significant amount of their time to do this type of thing because it is good to nominate your colleagues for awards, but it does take an enormous amount of time. And uh, if you think about it, because um, writing up the, uh, a, a, a really good justification and and uh, trying to convince the peers who are reviewing these things that you know this is the type of person who should work with an award is, is, is a lot of work. And uh, so uh, I think that the nomination process is actually very, very important. And I agree that uh, the, uh, the juries that I've sat on for prizes, uh, there is discussions about uh, you know which women are uh, I can't go into uh, details because they're confidential, but I've been in discussions where uh, women have been 
discussed uh, and they've delayed the nomination, uh, they've delayed uh, giving a, an award because uh, a, a, a woman who was uh, a candidate was not included in the nomination. And so then they drop went out and sorted. And that, that's what good prize jury should do. So it is actually a very complicated process. It is, but when you look at the last two awards, and my husband was on the jury one year, and when you look at the last two awards, the majority of people that are nominated are men mm -hmm. as opposed to women, and that because um, Maria shared that with us last year. And so you can say that it's a lot of work, it's a tremendous amount of work regardless of gender. Oh, it is. I'm, I wasn't so speaking it, about nominating women. I was talking about the women nominating people. And I think women are less comfortable seeking nominations. I'm, I'm positive of it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they feel they don't want to ask because it's so much work. And no. I think we have to change that. I think we have to change that mindset. Uh, apologies, I think you were. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the universities that I know has done this successfully took it as their past president or of the university. <coughs> that has, includes a medical school, and he has a, he was used to course delegating, so he has a full office staff, and they have gotten several members into the National Academies, uh, and every year I see nominations, because I sit on some of these committees, um, that uh, come from this university, and they're beautifully done, they're totally appropriate, they address the topic, and that university is promoting its women, and again, unless the women get one level, they're not going to get the next. They won't get the Lasker Award unless other things have happened. So um, it's it's really fascinating. This one university just had to find a job for its ex-president, and he took that on, and he's done a really good job. I'm sorry. So next was Melody. Uh, I just wanted to say that in my field, there are just so few women that we're asked to do so many things. It's really not possible to do all the different I things. So. Uh, as you said, we have to have better representation across the fields. Yes, I, I see what uh, Dr. Dresselhaus uh, mentioned, that I think the, the really qualified and very special women get asked to do so many things. You all must know that. Um, as a foundation that runs an awards program, and any single, any one of you is more than welcome to nominate for our award, I invite you to, please. Uh, but sometimes we very purposefully um, ask women to nominate and we've looked at the percentages year after year after year and um, women nominate just as many men as men do um, so I think this society um, is uh, spectacular and um, I'm sure you're making probably you are next I'd just like to follow up on Mary Ann's point in particular uh, with regard to this intersection of research and science and industry because um, now looking at the development of all aspects, uh, particularly in technology where uh, in my area of the country in Northern California uh, there's this huge boom and it is a boom that is almost exclusively male dominated. It is a boom where and in these scientific um, companies the representation of women on the boards is extraordinarily low. And um, it's especially low in Silicon Valley. And now as we begin to meld um, and we cross the boundaries with education and science and technology and we have the massive open online uh, coursework and courses and for-profit universities, um, I'm also concerned that the, the development of those curricula and the development and representation of women and women's uh, work in terms of coursework and getting that work to hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom will be women, will be also um, a, a very hard um, uh, row to hoe to get us uh, into that uh, visible position. But, you know, I have to confess some practical implications on those situations. So for example, I worked at uh, this very up and coming company called Millennium Pharmaceuticals. And uh, when I was there, it was like 
I mean, flying. I mean, I went there as an employee, I don't know, 99. And within a year, we were hiring 2000, employed 2,000. So it was uh, one of those companies that did very well and then also exploring in that way. What I noticed right away from those activities was that at the company, um, you know, we have a lot of presentations because we were biotech, so we were getting funding from all kinds of companies. So we were flying around all over the world, giving talks in uh, uh, different ph pharmaceutical companies. And then while we were traveling as a group, uh, many men after the, even after dinner, dinner ends by, you know, 9.30. Uh, I want to go back home so then I can do Skype or something with my daughter and then going over her homework. And, and that gives me great satisfaction, to be honest balancing between my exciting work and then also doing this very wonderful thing with my, uh, my family. Um, but my colleagues were going after having drinks and furthering their conversation from dinner. And when we came back to company then, uh, at the end of the year, we had what's called 360, you know, reviewing by everybody. Well, many people don't know me because I didn't hang around with them doing those activities. And uh, so I have to say that we just have to make clear decisions in thinking what we do. I mean, even at the Kavli Foundation, because I do travel a lot and you know, work is a lot, I made one principal decision, and that is every time I'm in town, I'm going home and cooking dinner for my family. And so, uh, and my family love my cooking, so <laughs> I really like that. And then, you know, we can be really goofy because all our work is so serious. You know, when I'm having dinner with my family, you know, we can do Gangnam style dancing and, you know, I mean, we can be as goofy as, as we want. So, um, so I, I leave my office at 5.30. I mean, it's not because I don't work late at night. After my dinner, you know, my husband goes back to his office and work more and I work further, especially we have all these Chinese programs and, and European programs, so we are working 24 seven in that way. But I noticed that, let's say, Fred and my Preston, who both actually don't have any of those obligations, like, at at the end of the day, around five or so, then they want to get together and make some decisions. Well, at 5.30, I'm leaving. No matter what, I'm just leaving. And uh, at first, I think that that really made Fred regret that they <laughs> he hired a woman executive. He thought, oh, brother. And I noticed that uh, when I was there first two years, he will actually have those meetings without me. And by the time I, when I came back following morning, many decisions were made without me. I still steady on, <laughs> kept that uh, schedule. And, uh, but by you know, being very productive, by like third year or so, he realized the kinds of things I can get done. And so usually, I mean, they still have some of the five o'clock meeting, but then 5.30, it's Fred who says, oh, oh Myung has to go for home for her cooking, so why don't we rejoin tomorrow morning? So I think that it takes time uh, to work with them, but to be honest, it's really hurtful that I cannot be uh, a woman and a mother and a wife uh, because of their schedule. But it happens, I think, all the time. Uh, you just have to, you know, stick to what you believe. My husband hates my cooking. <laughs> 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 with Marianne, with me, because no longer do I do experiments, but. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a scientist. I love doing science work. And to me, cooking is my science project. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, one, uh, have three different things. You mentioned Silicon Valley. The same thing is being found in Cambridge, in your fair city, uh, that women are not being included on some of the new, uh, uh, the newest biotech, and especially the boards, and I think I think that's an issue that we have to deal with. Second thing, very short, is that my sons cook for their wives, and they insist upon being home for dinner because that's more fun. So I think part of it is a generational thing. Definitely. And I think we will be yeah. seeing some changes as men realize that life is bigger than just being in the lab or on a board. Mm -hmm. But the third thing, I'm uh, the chair of the Women in Cell Biology Committee within the American Society for Cell Biology. 
So talking about prizes, we give out two awards. One is a Junior Woman Award. Yukiko is one of the people who's recently received that. And then there's a senior one for someone who's not only an outstanding scientist, but a mentor. And that can go for a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. What we've done is to, we've really worked out over the years how to get the best nomination packet. And we give these guidelines. We then use those packets not just for our awards. We use them for other awards that have come up within ASCB. Mm -hmm. So for example, this year's Wilson Awardee, which is the highest award you can get at ASCB, is going to woman. It's going to Susan Hockfeld, in fact. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, and it came out of the fact that we had her packet. And when we said, yes, she's excellent, but this should be, in fact, going on to the whole ASCB. So I think that's one of the things we can do, too. If we educate people on how to make a really good nomination packet, it's so simple to just switch the name of the organization and the award. Mm -hmm. And so that work can really become a doubly effective. It can, it can just have exponential uh, impact if you, get, if you begin to develop these award packets for outstanding women. A question, Sandra. Is women in cell biology made up only of women? No. 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 You have men on we have men. Harvey Lodish yes. and James My mentor, Nelson. Yes. <laughs> Harvey Lodish and James Nelson. Yeah, we call them our alpha male. I, I was in his lab, yes. I know. So he's we very good with women. Men and women he's, <laughs> he's great. He's he totally supportive. Yeah. yeah. So we have both men and women. The commu committee is primarily women, but we always have at least two men on it. Uh, and they're very good. <laughs> Actually, Harvey Lodish wrote on an article when he was a president of ACB. He wrote yeah. on actually an article about his own experience having so many, women, uh, yes. and he also emphasizes not only just women in his own lab, but also how he treats men who are married or right. have <clears throat> significant others and so on. And and it's very family oriented lab where uh, you can bring kids. On weekend in our floor, it's like you can't tell the difference between mm -hmm. laboratory at MIT versus like nursing home. I mean, uh, the, I mean the younger <laughs> no, people. Nursery. Yeah. Nursery. I mean, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> nursery. But along those lines, in fact, we perhaps I can get a little brainstorming here. We uh, at ASCB, we work very hard. The council listens to us, and so we do have a good representation of women, especially as the symposia speakers, and that's terribly important. So then why does this happen when we go to other meetings, we see that even though the same fields are there, there are no women speakers. So actually with Harvey's help, we've put together a speakers list. And we have it on the website so that anybody can download it. And what we do is we take the name of every woman in the last five years who's spoken at a symposium or headed a mini symposium, and we say, here, you can go and look. We have their topics. We have where they are. We say these people have been vetted already. We also have the alternative. If you don't want to go to that, you can contact Harvey. And he'll identify women for you. We decided Harvey was a better friend than I was. Okay. <laughs> But we're still not getting enough people going to that. And how do you get people to realize there's a resource out there? It's very hard Mary because RFS does it all the time. Mm -hmm. We set up all of these notifications for sent out notifications for all sorts of opportunities. Women do not generally speak. Step up to the plate in the same way. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. You could say they feel that it might be, you know, the stereotype of aggressive being versus a certain, and I don't buy any of that anymore. I think that's an excuse, and I think we just have to teach women how to do it. They don't know how to do it the same way. Joe Handelson shared with me years ago that she, was, she wanted to be nominated for a particular award, but that she was embarrassed to ask, and when she did ask, uh, somebody said, oh, you know, I'm busy, I'll do it next year, or something like that. And so she, I don't think she asked him again. But I think women have to know how to ask and how to position it. And that, that's, that's saying, to hell with the stereotypes. That's old, that's, that's old news already. Let's move past this now and let's learn how to do it effectively, saying men and women are equal. Let's teach you how to do it more effectively. And I think that would be very valuable. We would be very happy to take that on 
if we think that it, uh, it, it will be useful. Yeah, I was going to suggest that too. Um, that so switch. Okay. Is that on? Okay. Is this on? No. no. That's the other one. Just ask me worry about the notes. <laughs> yes, Do you want to use okay. this one? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, I think it's a great idea for the Rosenfunken Society to take it on. In the context of our Women's Rights Prize, one of the organizations we worked with was the National Council for Research on Women. It's a US-based organization. But a lot of what they do is offer workshops, totally practical, totally hands-on, step-by-step. And they have an agenda of understanding why, for example, in financial institutions, women who perform uh, the same as any other partner at, say, Goldman Sachs or Lehman or any of the other institutions are not members of the board. They don't have a decision-making role. Um, they're hired. Uh, they tout the fact that they have gender diversity, but the women don't make the decisions. So this organization analyzed, um, brought up the issues as much as Rosalind Franklin is doing for women in science. Just look at the accountability. Look at where women are on the boards and what's being happened there. And analytical, practical, what does it take? Study the culture. What is the culture? Um, what are the steps to getting on the board? Um, what does it mean to get on the board? What do you have to do? Do you have to uh, go have drinks at 5.30? And if you can't, what are the alternatives? Find a mentor. How do you find a mentor? Um, if you're reviewed and you don't make it, have the courage to find out why you didn't make it. Um, if one person doesn't nominate you, how do you go to the person who will nominate you? How do you learn to talk about what you do with not necessarily an aggressive pride, but with simply being able to actually present yourself? Um, one of the hilarious quotes um, is the codfish lays 10,000 eggs, the humble hen, but one. We scorn, no, the codfish never cackles to tell us what he's done. We scorn the lowly codfish, while the humble hen we prize, which only goes to show it pays to advertise. <laughs> So I think there's a lot to be said for women, a, a lesson to be learned in that, which is, so what if it's not easy? It's what it takes. Um, if you can't talk about your work and its broad implications or the profound significance of what it is you're working on, um, then who's going to know? You can't depend on others to do that. Um, it's important. It's important for collaboration. It isn't necessarily self-aggrandizing. But it's important. It's important for the field. And I think to just take a realistic look at that um, is, you know, is crucial. And I think to present a packet of practical, hands-on, applicable to science, um, there are a lot of places that that information um, can be derived from. So, yeah. You know, in the field of biotechnology, when you publish mm -hmm. a very substantial publication, Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. And we know these biotech companies well. And one of the things women do not present as well as is showing that they have an understanding of money, mm -hmm. of finance, mm -hmm. of what something is going to cost, mm -hmm. how to leverage an investment. Mm -hmm. So when people are looking to build boards like that, mm -hmm. they want somebody who also has this knowledge. Mm -hmm. And women have not been, a and that doesn't negate the scientific contribution, and this is what, of course, you know, we had a game one time called Monoclonopoly, and there were two tracks, the business track and the science track, and what we showed was to have a successful biotechnology company, you had to be able to play both tracks, and that's still true. So women have to be able to show, they don't have to be accountants, they don't have to be CPAs, but they have to show an understanding, whether it's for a board that is giving 
a prize or whether it's for a board that is a corporate board, all of these things have realistic financial constraints and goals, and it's important to be able to understand those, I think. And I don't think women show have convinced the powers that be that they have this understanding. Uh, I wanted to raise the uh, issue of my, my own career because I was on all these corporate boards and I did all these different things in my career. Uh, and uh, I, I think it all started when I became director of the Material Center, which was a large center at, at MIT. I was the only female member of the center, but I was the director. And so it helped because I got administrative experience. I learned how to manage a lot of money and all kind of stuff like that. It wasn't my choice. I mean, I didn't volunteer to be director of the center, but I, I was just selected and I did the job. Uh, and this led to being appointment, appointed at various corporate boards. And when I served on corporate boards, I wasn't in the back room. I was right there making all the decisions with the guys. I, I, I'm in my field, I don't see uh, women anyhow, so I'm used to working with men because I work with them all the time, and they're used to me. So uh, uh, they will nominate me because uh, somebody asked, well, you know a woman that can do X, Y, Z? So they'll think of us. So I think what's important for us to do is to, if we're asked to do these, maybe not go for them because I still love doing science. I like that much better than administration, but I, I do have that experience. I have experience with money. I was treasurer of the National Academy of Sciences, and I was treasurer of lots of other things before that uh, where I got a, other experience about investment and all this kind of stuff. And so I know something about it, but I, it's not what I look to do, but I learned about that by being on boards. So. Uh, what I could say is if you get some administrative experience in your own institution that makes you visible and you show that you can do a good job at that, uh, that is, I think, the key for us to get there the same way the guys do. But we're lucky we're going to hear more details of this experience. No, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really, you must ask me about that. I, I'm leaving a lot of time in my time allotment because uh, I didn't know what you wanted and I don't have the right talk for you. <laughs> your life, your life, your life. Well, thank you. We'll have time for more questions um, certainly over lunch. We'll hear more from Professor Dresselhaus at lunch. I um, just want to move on for one last talk sitting between you and lunch.